The circuit diagram that we'll use for a transmission line is one that is uh, very literal, very physical in terms of a transmission line. There are two black lines which correspond to the two wires, the two conductors. Um, you can think of the top one as the, uh, the top side conductor, and then the bottom, of course, is the bottom side conductor. The uh, region in the middle is then corresponds to or indicates the dielectric that separates uh, these two wires. And if we go down the line, we see that the cross section of the symbol is constant. I can slice this symbol at any place, and we find that the uh, uh, essentially the cross section that we see is is constant and that's what must be true of a transmission line we want what we call controlled impedances that uh, um, a uh, uh, transmission line that uh, that's twice as long as a similar transmission line will have simply twice the amount of things like reactance inductance capacitance and so forth um, the key thing to keep bear in mind about the length of transmission line then is it is a two-port device. It's a two-port device. You have port one on one side and port one on the other. Now what we're going to do here is try to uh, demonstrate to create the mathematical description, description of what goes on in a transmission line. Um, we could go through and we will eventually um, talk about the trans impedance parameters that characterize uh, um, this transmission line. And since it's a two port device, it'll be four complex um, values for Z11 and Z22 and Z12 and 21, for example. We'll get to that later, but first we need to understand physically what is occurring. Analyze this. Uh, two-port device at a structural or, or schematic level. To do that, we need to talk about the physical description of the device itself. And there's going to be five real parameters that fully characterize this uh, two-port device that we call a transmission line. So the first real parameter that we use to characterize uh, our transmission line is normalized resistance. And of course, the two conductors, the two wires that make up our transmission lines, uh, generally speaking, are made up of materials which have excellent conductivity, things like copper, for example. Uh, they're not perfectly conducting, but they're highly conducting. And so what we'll find is the resistance of those wires are very low. The resistance is although not zero. Uh, the resistance then uh, that we use to characterize those is resistance per unit length. Once again, we're not considered, we're not concerned necessarily with the uh, uh, resistance of the tire line. We're uh, concerned with characterizing the resistance per unit length. We can think of it as ohms per meters, although usually uh, unit length of centimeters is uh, uh, more useful to us in uh, uh, transmission line analysis. So this R that we have is our normalized resistance. And when we say normalized, we mean uh, normalized to unit length. Uh, the second parameter, we're going to talk about a real value parameter uh, for characterizing a, a length of transmission line or a transmission line is the conductance per unit length. There is a material that separates our two conducting structure, two wires, a rigid uh, material oftentimes, um, uh, and that is an insulating material. And the conductivity, of course, of an insulating material is very low, but it's not zero. And so we talk about the conductivity of that insulating material uh, between the two wires. Uh, we characterize it in terms of normalized conductance, um, uh, conductance per unit length, and we call that real value G. Now, in addition to R and G, resistance and conductance per unit length, uh, we have two more real value parameters, and these are really the crucial ones with respect to transmission line behavior. R and G are typically very low, and we'll find that uh, uh, they are uh, generally so insignificant with respect to transmission line behavior that we often simply neglect them and uh, approximate those values at zero, which really simplifies our mathematical analysis and gives us an answer that's very close uh, in accuracy. The two, again, param uh, most important physical parameters then are L, which is inductance per unit length. This uh, talks about the self-inductance of the wire um, that we discussed earlier, and just like RNG, it's written in terms of per unit length. So it would be Henry's per meter, for example, or Henry's 
uh, per centimeter. Capacitance per length, likewise, um, <clears throat> in terms of farads per centimeters, for example, and normalized capacitance per unit length. And of course, both these values are dependent on the structure of the um, transmission line itself, its cross section and how it's designed. Uh, for capacitance, it also depends on the dielectric constant of that insulator that separates those two wires. So the uh, fifth parameter, the fifth real value parameter that is used to characterize um, the length of the transmission line is, in fact, the length of the transmission line. We'll call that value L, and that's simply the distance from one end, from one port to the other, the physical uh, distance between those uh, two planes. Um, and so uh, the four or five parameters then that we talk about are R, G, L, and C. Now, L can be used to... Uh, determine the sort of overall resistance or capacitance or inductance since we know the uh, for example inductance per unit length we can multiply that by the um, length of the transmission line to determine the total inductance and the length uh, of a conductor a wire of transmission line So an example of uh, this idea, if we had a length of transmission line, length L, and that transmission line <clears throat> had some value of resistance R in ohms per meter, and we wanted to know the total resistance then of a length of transmission line, it'd be pretty simple. We take the uh, normalized resistance in ohms per meter and multiply it by the length of the transmission line uh, in meters, and that would provide us then the value of resistance. And generally speaking, this would be uh, a very small number. Let's say our two-port device, or we had a two-port device that was made up of lumped elements, resistors, inductors, capacitors, and so forth. Uh, kind of the circuits that you used uh, or you looked at uh, up till now in your uh, study of electrical engineering. And uh, most of the time, when we had such a circuit, we had to label each of those elements, each of those devices, so we could write down mathematics that made sense with respect to that label. We might call, uh, if we had a countable number of these uh, lumped element devices, then we would give it a uh, integer index. So the first element we'd call one, and the next one we call two, and the next one and call three. So we might have L1 and C2 and R3 and so forth. And of course that allowed us to go through and talk about currents and voltages with respect to each of those devices and uh, oftentimes denote currents then as uh, uh, I1 and I2 and I3 or voltages as V1 and V2 and V3, each corresponding by their integer index to a specific lumped element in that circuit. Of course, again, that allows us to really go through and uh, use our mathematics to analyze it, to use uh, KCL, for example, to say, you know, I1 plus I2 plus I3 is equal to zero or whatever it, uh, it, it turned out uh, to be. Now, in our length of transmission line, um, even though we know there's <clears throat> there's uh, self-inductance and capacitance there, uh, there's lots of reactants involved in those two port devices, those reactances, inductance capacitance, are distributed throughout the transmission line from one end to the other. They don't reside in any one point, they are a continuum of inductance and capacitance. So how do we go through and write an index that makes sense for mathematics if instead of having a capacitor here, an inductor here, everything is distributed evenly? To provide an index for these types of circuits where we have a continuum of reactants distributed across the length, we have to use an index that is not discrete, an integer, but instead one that is a continuous index. And so for every transmission line schematic, we need to go through, just like any other circuit schematic, instead of going and saying this is element one and element two and element three, we need to go through and define an index by first drawing a continual real line. And we usually call this real line Z. Now, if it were up to me, we would have called it something different. There are way too many Zs in microwave engineering and radio engineering, but it's the standard is to call this index Z, so I will uh, can you, uh, continue with that, uh, with that standard. If we write down a transmission line, generally speaking or schematic, we will draw this index as moving, increasing as we move from left to right. Now, we'll see later, we don't have to do it that way. We can write an index that would be increasing as we move from <clears throat> um, right to left. But the standard typically is to write it 
increasing as we move from left to right. Now this is arbitrary from the standpoint of the orientation of the of the transmission line. Of course we could take the transmission line itself and flip it around and uh, that presumably then would move the index with it around the other way. But of course the transmission line is a symmetric structure so if we did just flip our transmission line around we wouldn't really change the uh, uh, circuit at all, the network at all, so similar to if we flip the orientation of a resistor or inductor, uh, the uh, mathematics would be invariant uh, to that rotation. All right, <clears throat> um, so not only do we have to define an index, and generally speaking, again, we define it as increase, Z is increasing as we move from left to right, we must define uh, essentially the center of this real line, the uh, index for the value of z is equal to zero. And where is z is equal to zero along this index? Well, that's up to us to sign. Just like we arbitrarily had z increasing as we move from left to right, we can arbitrarily locate the uh, location of the point of line, which we call z is equal to zero. So you're probably familiar uh, with the U.S. interstate system, highway system. If you're driving along, you see alongside the road uh, a set of numbers, which are mile markers. And of course, what happens is every mile there is a, a change in this number, an increase of one or a decrease of one, depending on the direction that you are going. Now, if we drive by a mile marker and it says 825, what does that really signify? To a certain extent, it's arbitrary. It's based on how many miles from the state line, for example. Um, and so the number by itself isn't very helpful. What is helpful, though, is that if we know if we're at eight, uh, mile marker 825 and we want to go um, further down the road 10 miles, uh, that the mile marker, we need to move until we get to mile marker 835. Or if uh, we're at 825 and we want to uh, um, uh, move to a town uh, at uh, at 840, the mile marker 840, that means that we need to move further down the, the interstate for 15 more miles. And so that's how we use mile markers, either to uh, know where we are, to know how many uh, more miles we need to go to get to a certain mile marker, or um, uh, given the distance between two miles markers, the difference between the dist between two mile markers, that tells us the distance between those two points. So it's a similar thing with the index that we use on our transmission line. The index Z needs to be in units of distance. And again, this is arbitrary. You can use whatever units of distance you want. Uh, generally speaking, arbitrarily we'll say meters, but in a pragmatic practical way, centimeters is usually more helpful to us in, uh, in most radio frequency uh, designs. Um, and so as we move down the uh, index Z, uh, we find the value of Z will increase. And so if we're at some point and we move uh, a meter further down the line, then our index will increase by a value of one. It doesn't mean the index there is one, it just means it's a value of one larger than it was when we start. And so to make sense of all this, we have to define some location where the value is z is equal to zero, the center of our real line. And this is again completely arbitrary. If we had a transmission line of two meters and we have our z increasing from left to right, we, in, we could go through and arbitrarily declare the point at the beginning of the line as a value of z is equal to zero. So if we move down the index, continue down the index to the other end of the line, we have moved two meters. We started at zero, we added two meters to it. That means the index now at the other end of the line has a value of two. Of course, we didn't have to put the index z is equal to zero here at the beginning of the line. We could have put z is equal to zero here at the end of the line. Again, this is arbitrary. The transmission line does not know, nor does it care, what our indexes are. Just like the inductors and capacitors and resistors in your uh, lumped element circuit, you know, they don't they don't change their mathematical behavior. If you call uh, one uh, inductor L, uh, inductor three, or you call it an inductor five, uh, whether you give it the voltage across uh, V3 or you say the voltage across it is is V5. Again, the, the inductor doesn't know. It doesn't 
care. It won't change its physics. It, the index just allows us um, to keep track of our mathematics, essentially, in the analysis. And so either one of these indexes that we have, the first or the second, is correct. And students struggle with this because they think there must be some correct index. But again, I try to get students to go back to the lumped element circuit um, uh, example there. There is uh, there is no way to say that, uh, you know, this resistor should be R1 and someone else say, oh, no, that resistor should be R1. Or third student say, no, I think this th resistor should be R1. Well, any of them are sufficient, just as long as each resistor is are, is independently and, and uh, uniquely labeled, rather, um, then you can come up with the right answer. And so that's the same thing that we want with our index, that every location is uniquely um, uh, specified numerically. Um, <clears throat> So for the case where z is equal to zero here at the other end of the line, uh, now if we move back to the left, in this case we're moving in the direction of decreasing z. And so we move back to the beginning, well we've moved, we decrease by a value of two meters. We started at zero, that's our mile marker where we began, and we move back the other way in a decreasing index and in, for two meters. When we stop then, of course, our index would be minus two minus two plus two meters is zero. Zero minus two meters is minus two. So you see how that works with the index. Of course, halfway uh, down the transmission line would then give us an index Z is equal to minus one. In the uh, top index here, halfway down the line or halfway between either end would give us a index Z, which is equal to one. Now, we don't have to assign the index z is equal to zero to uh, either end of the line. We could arbitrarily define the index at the beginning of the line, let's say z is equal to three. Well, now if I uh, move to the middle of the transmission line where an index z is equal to four, if I move another uh, meter uh, in the direction of increasing z to the other end of the transmission line, there I would have index z is equal to five. At this point, we say z is equal to 3. At this point, we say z is equal to 5. At this point, we say z is equal to 4 if we are in the middle. All right, so just make sure you understand how this all works. We could go through and write the index the opposite direction. So c is increasing as we move from uh, from right to left. And so in that case, if we uh, declare this index z is equal to minus 1, and we move in the direction of increasing z to the other end, we've moved 2 meters increasing z so we start at minus one we add two and we get plus one for the other index in this case the index for the point at halfway is z is equal to zero again the point here is that any of these indexes are correct you can use any of them as long as you specify uniquely one of them and you stick with that index as you go through and do the analysis sometimes the problems we have is students will change their index halfway through the analysis and that's like going through and uh, changing the index on your uh, uh, lumped element circuit you know in, in one equation i call this l1 and now in the similar next equation and I call a different element L1 uh, with the voltage V1, well, you're going to end up with the wrong answer. So the most prevalent way of defining an index, and again, it's arbitrary. It's not the right way. It's just the most prevalent way, and we'll use this index uh, mainly in this class, is to, again, draw the index Z as increasing as we move from left to right. Uh, uh, across the page. And we're going to define then the uh, end of the transmission line on the right side. We're going to define that end of the transmission line as uh, index z is equal to zero. That is the point in the index defined as z is equal to zero. Well, if that's the case, and we have a transmission line of length L in meters, then the index at the beginning of the transmission line back here, we have zero. We're decreasing our index by a value of L. And so the value of the index here at the other end of the line is Z is equal to minus L. So just like our earlier example, if we have a transmission line uh, length of two meters, then we have an index here, which would be minus two. Halfway between the two uh, um, between the two ports of the transmission line, at the halfway point, that index then would be um, z is equal to minus l divided by two, one half uh, minus l. It's important to note then that all of the indexes for this transmission line are somewhere between zero and minus l. When I say 
uh, less than, but it really meant to less than or equal to here. Uh, Z could be anything from minus L to zero. So again, that really means that Z uh, for all these locations, all of these indexes have a negative value. So students often wonder why do we even need to uh, define this index Z? What is the, the what is the point uh, in doing this? Remember, we have uh, transmission line length, and we're using frequencies that are very high. Uh, we cannot in, uh, ignore the induced voltages nor the uh, displacement current uh, in the transmission line, because we'll find that the current and voltage at either end of the line will be dissimilar. They will be different. So it's no surprise that if the current at one of the line is different than the current and the other in the line, that the current at one of the line is different than, let's say, the current halfway down the line in the middle, or between the end of the line here and the current uh, a third of the way down the line. What we'll find as we move up and down the transmission line and we look at the current flowing at each location on this wire, we will find that we get a different value. And again, the reason we have a different, it doesn't violate KCL, the reason we have a different current at different location is because the displacement current effectively that is flowing from one wire to the other. Physically, what's really happening is charge is piling up um, or dissipating as we move up and down this transmission line. Same thing for voltage. We look at the voltage at one end of our transmission line is different than the voltage at the other end. And what we'll find then is the voltage at one end is different. Let's say the voltage if I measure between the top conductor and bottom conductor <clears throat> at a point halfway between the two ends or between the voltage at one end and a voltage at, let's say, a point that's three quarters the distance between the two ends. Again, I will get a different complex number, perhaps not a significant complex number, a significant difference, I should say. Uh, although in many cases it is, will be a very significant uh, uh, difference between uh, uh, the voltage or current at one point and the other. So what we're going to find then is the current and voltage, the current along our wire, and the voltage difference between the two conductors changes at every index Z. What we're looking for then is a continuous function of index Z that describes the complex voltage and complex current in total, a function that allows us to determine the complex voltage and current at any specific point that we desire from one end of the transmission line to the other. So there are two complex functions of position that we are ultimately seeking, all right? The current, uh, uh, that flows along our transmission line. And again, what we see here is that current, that complex number, will change as a function of position. As we move up and down the line, and therefore index will change, the complex value of current I will change. Now notice I put in this function uh, that I show that's with respect to position uh, index Z, which definitely it is, but also I show that it's uh, with respect to frequency omega. And this is non-standard notation. Most of the time you won't see uh, you won't see it written as, as I sub Z omega. Let's write it as I sub Z. I put this in there to try to emphasize to students that these functions depend on frequency. If we change the frequency of the sinusoidal oscillation, and again the assumption here is, I mean after all if we're determining complex voltages and currents, they only make sense if we have a sinusoidal excitation. An excitation of some frequency omega. The results we get will depend on that frequency. We change the frequency, we will change these functions with respect to z. And so I'll leave this omega in there to try to emphasize that everything depends on omega. Eventually I'll, uh, drop, uh, I'll, I'll drop that notation because it just gets a little bit too cluttered and cumbersome there. But I hope by that point you'll realize that all these results are dependent on omega explicitly. If we change the frequency, we will get different results. One other note about our statement about this uh, notation that I use here. Again, this function of uh, current describes a current at every point along this transmission line, from an index of z is equal to minus l all the way to an index of z is equal to zero. It is a continuous function of position z. Now, to write this schematically, I have a problem. If I had lumped elements, I could go through and say at one point right here, it's I1. Another element over here, it's I2. The arrows indicate specifically the location of the current 
uh, to which the variable um, uh, represents. But for a continuous function of position z, where z starts here at this end, z is equal to minus l, it goes to the other end, z is equal to zero, uh, there's no way of writing this arrow and this symbol uh, such that it is located exactly in all locations that it represents. I'd have to like take an arrow and, you know, in a, in a, in a variable, stretch it out, you know, across the entire uh, transmission line. So instead, I put an arrow uh, at some point on the transmission line, and I write um, above that arrow then the current as a function of position z. This does not indicate that I'm talking about the current at this specific location. If I say that is a function of z, then there's no way I could be specifying it at this location. This value has a specific, this location I should say, has a specific numeric value of z. Let's say I was worrying about or I wanted to know what the current is, let's say halfway down the line, halfway between one end and the other. What would I do? Well, I would take this function and I would evaluate it at one specific number at a value of z is equal to minus l over 2. If I want to know the current right here at the very end of the transmission line, I would take this function and I would evaluate it at z is equal to 0. If I want to know at the other end, I'd evaluate it at z is equal to minus l and so forth and so this function does not say z is equal to some specific number it is a function of z and so this is a function that describes the current anywhere and everywhere up and down the line i have to put it somewhere on the transmission line but this does not imply that the current somehow is residing at this location again the current changes there's a current at every location along the transmission line and that value changes with respect to position z described by this continuous function i, a complex function i with respect to position z that depends on frequency omega. The similar thing then for voltage. We are going to describe the voltage at some location. And literally that is if I took the uh, voltage from one point on the top conductor and compared it to the voltage, the uh, voltage uh, the difference between uh, the uh, same location, the same point on the bottom conductor. So if I go through and say z is equal to zero, on the bottom conductor I have this location, the top loca uh, conductor I have this location, and then the value of v uh, at z is equal to zero is the voltage between these two points. The uh, measurement we get the, when we do the integration of the electric field between these two points. Or the voltage here at the beginning of the line. We simply evaluate this as z is equal to minus l, or at the middle we'd evaluate this function as z is equal to minus l over 2. When we evaluate this function at specific values of z, that will turn this function of z into a numeric value, which is the complex voltage at the location. The magnitude then describing the magnitude of oscillation in the phase of that complex number describes the phase, the relative phase of that oscillation. Again, just like current, I have to put the symbol for voltage somewhere on this transmission line to show where is plus and where is minus. I could put this symbol here or here or here or here. Regardless of where I put this symbol V, plus or minus, <clears throat> what we're saying here is it is the voltage of the transmission line at, any, at all locations from one end to the other. The fact that I wrote it down at this location does not imply that somehow this is only describing the voltage at this location. The voltage at this location is a number. It cannot be a function of position z. All right, so make sure that you understand that. One last thing I should have pointed out, I have an arrow. All right, going to the right, what does that mean? That is simply defining the um, uh, the direction in which what in which I consider the current to be positive. Remember, we're talking about sinusoidal currents here, and so half the time it's sloshing one way, and half the time it's sloshing the other. Um, um, you know, half a cycle in one way, and half the cycle another. This arrow simply means that the half cycle where the charge is moving in that direction, the positive charge is moving that that direction. We denote that. Uh, direction to be positive, mathematically positive. So it's imperative that you put the current here, current arrow here, I should say. Uh, and this is standard, is to define positive current, the direction of positive current, to be exactly the same as the direction of increasing z. 
You don't have to do it that way. Again, there's nothing physical about what you're stating. You're simply denoting what is a positive value for current. But the notation, standard notation, is uh, for uh, most of the time engineers will define positive current as flowing in the same direction as increasing index Z. So let's look closer at what we mean by when we say we have a continuous function of voltage, where voltage is a complex voltage, or the current is a complex current. What do we mean by that with respect to the transmission lines? Well, it's the same thing we mean for any uh, complex voltage and complex current. If we describe a uh, voltage or current as complex, of course, that only makes sense if we have a sinusoidal excitation at some frequency omega. And what we're saying is that the uh, magnitude of the complex number describes the magnitude of the oscillation, and the relative phase defines the relative phase of that oscillation. So to see that, we can take, let's say, the voltage as a continuous function of, of position Z. Again, changes with respect to uh, frequency omega. And like any complex number, we can write it in the form where we have the magnitude times e to the J phi <clears throat> in there, where that is the... Uh, uh, that is the face. And so we can rewrite it then in this form. Um, in this case, this function, of course, is the magnitude of the oscillation. This is a real value. All right, this is a complex, but this is the magnitude of the oscillation, and the magnitude is a real value. Moreover, that is mag that real value is always positive, so don't uh, don't say that the magnitude of the oscillation is negative. If we have a negative oscill a magnitude, what that really implies is a phase shift of 180 degrees, and that should show up then in the phase. V is always real and a positive. Phi is always real in a number between either 0 and 2 pi or minus pi and pi, depending on how you uh, define uh, your phase circle. So if we can take our complex functions of current and voltage and rewrite them in terms of explicitly a function of magnitude and relative phase, what does that tell us physically about what's going on the transmission line? Well, like everything in this class, we're going to assume, since we have linear time invariant circuits, we're going to assume that the excitation ultimately is a sinusoidal excitation, a, uh, a sinusoidal excitation with some specific frequency omega. And like we learned uh, earlier, if we excite a linear time invariant circuit with some sinusoid of frequency, let's say uh, 5 gigahertz, then what we'll find at every location in that linear time invariant circuit, uh, every current and every voltage will likewise be a sinusoidal sinusoidal sinusoid of frequency of 5 gigahertz. The only question is how big is the magnitude of that oscillation and what is the relative phase? And of course that's what the complex function tells us, how big the uh, oscillation is, magnitude is, and what is its relative phase. Of course this will be different in every location in our circuit with respect to a transmission line. Every lo different location in our circuit means every different location along that transmission line. Every different um, value of position index Z. So we know how to undo our uh, compression algorithm, as it were, with respect to describing the sinusoidal oscillations. If I'm given some complex function of uh, voltage uh, that changes with respect to uh, frequency omega in position z, uh, if I want to know the magnitude of the sinusoidal, sinusoidal oscillations, I simply take the magnitude of this complex function, a real valued function. V is a real value plus it's positive. It changes with respect to position Z and frequency omega. That tells us how big the magnitude of the oscillation is. And notice again, it's a function of position Z. So I go over to some point in my transmission line, and if I were to measure the voltage between two points at that same location, top conductor and bottom conductor, I might see that it's oscillating with a certain magnitude. If I move to a different point of the line, and I look again at the voltage between two points at a different location Z, I will find it's the same oscillation with the same frequency, but instead of having maybe a magnitude of something like this, I might have the same frequency, a much larger magnitude in oscillation. If I move to another point on the transmission line, I find again a sinusoid of exactly the same frequency, but now the magnitude again might be something that's far smaller than the either of the two.
In fact, we'll find later that we can move to a point of transmission line in certain cases and find that the magnitude of oscillation has gone to zero. In other words, there is no oscillation at all. The voltage is zero at uh, certain points on the line, uh, and that happens for certain situ situations. At all other points on the line, it may be non-zero, but at certain locations we might find that the magnitude even could go to zero. The important thing is what we're saying that as we move up and down the transmission line and we measure the voltage at different locations, at every location, we'll find an, a sinusoidal oscillation of exactly the same frequency as all others. But what we'll find is the magnitude of that oscillation at each and individual, each and every point, where will be, generally speaking, different from each other. So what's the function then that describes that change in magnitude? Can we write a mathematical statement for the magnitude of the oscillation uh, as a function of position along a transmission line? And that's what we are trying to uh, achieve. That's what we seek to find. Same thing for the relative phase. If I go to some point in the transmission line and I measure the uh, uh, voltage, uh, top conductor to bottom conductor there, and I and I look at it uh, as a function of time, is we'd see that again the same sinusoidal oscillation, the same frequency, up and down. If I go to a different location and I measure the voltage there, different index Z, what we find is that the relative phase between those oscillations are not necessarily going to be the same. Perhaps we might look at two different points and we find the oscillation is in phase, in phase, or we might find that they're 180 degrees out of phase, or we might find that they're 90 degrees out of phase one way or 90 degrees out of phase the other. So as we move up and down the transmission line, what we find is the relative phase of that oscillation will change. And the question is, how will that relative phase change? It'll be different at every location, but can we write a mathematical statement to describe this function, the phase as a function of position? If we can, and we will, and we combine this function with this function, of course we can combine them together into a complex function of position that describes the magnitude relative phase of the oscillation at every point along the transmission line. You change the location of the transmission line, we'll find that you get a different magnitude and phase. Of course, if you change the frequency of the excitation, you'll likewise find that the magnitude and phase will be different at the same, even if you don't change the uh, location Z. So we've been talking about the uh, uh, voltage as a complex function of position Z, as a complex voltage. And again, that really is a mathematical abstraction that allows us to, to determine what is going on uh, at each location on the transmission line. A more physically descriptive uh, description of what's going on uh, is, of course, this one here. This shows the real value of the voltage, and the voltage is a real value now, as a function of both position and time. And so we know that, uh, again, that the voltage will change as a sinusoidal oscillation with some frequency omega. It will have a magnitude, uh, which is a, a positive real value, and a relative phase, uh, likewise, that describes it. And the magnitude and the relative phase will change as a function of position z. Notice omega does not change as a function of position z. Remember, if we excite a circuit with a source at uh, 5 gigahertz, then the uh, uh, sinusoidal excitation at every point on the transmission line, regardless of index z, will be 5 gigahertz. Now, how's, what's the relationship between our real valued function of voltage, a function of both position and time, explicitly in terms of time here, once we uh, write it as a sinusoid? What's the relationship between that and our complex representation? Notice there was no time variable in our complex representation there. <clears throat> Um, if you go back and look at the first thing we covered in this class, we know how we get from a complex function uh, or a complex number into a real sinusoidal representation or back again um, was described in this way. We take our complex function of z and we multiply it by e to the j omega t. Um, <clears throat> we go through then take the real part of that result. And we take the real part of that result, essentially we're applying Euler's uh, formula, take the real part, and that pulls out the cosine omega t. And so uh, we can uh, always take our complex function of position z, our complex voltage here, and uh, from that extract the real value 
uh, description, the one that really is more physical uh, in terms of what's going on, changing as a function of position and time. Now, students always wonder, why don't we do this more? This is more physical. This is more descriptive. This is really what's happening here. And of course, as engineers, we can always take our complex result and convert it back into a real value, but we don't because it really doesn't tell us anything we didn't already know. From the complex value, we know the magnitude. From the complex value, we know the phase. We know that the sinus it'll be sinusoidal and we know it'll have frequency omega so after we do all this work we really don't have anything here that we couldn't have said already or we didn't know already so typically we work with uh, just complex functions of voltages and complex functions of time i'm sorry complex functions of current rather So for current, um, this is the relationship between the complex function uh, for current and the resulting real valued current, one that is a function of both position and time. We simply take the complex function for current and multiply it by e to j omega t. That's where the t comes in. Expand this using Euler's equation. Uh, take the real part and we're left with the sinusoid, a real valued current uh, that changes both with respect to position and time. Again, it's a sinusoid with respect to omega, just the same omega that created the voltage. They, they both have the same uh, frequency there. But the uh, magnitude as a function of position for current will be different than the magnitude as a function of position for voltage. They're not going to be the same uh, function. They're not going to have the same form. The same with the phase. We see that the phase will change as a function of position up and down the line, the relative phase there, but it will change in a way that generally speaking is different than the function that describes the phase, um, relative phase of the oscillation of the voltage. So again, the Omega frequency is the same for current and voltage, but the magnitude and the and the relative phase will be very different, generally speaking, for current than it will be for voltage. Let's see then if we can determine what these complex functions are for um, complex voltage as a function of position and complex current as a function of position z along our transmission line. So to uh, begin doing that, we first take a little sliver of our transmission line. So we take our transmission line and we just sort of cut a little tiny slice out of it there. And we can expand then the slice and show that here. So here's our transmission line. We're going to call the current and voltage at one of the line, uh, the current and voltage at Z. And since the length of this little sliver of transmission line is some delta Z, then we can likewise describe the current and voltage at the other end as, uh, as, as I at index Z plus delta Z and voltage at Z plus delta Z, since again we've moved a value of delta Z. Now notice the two currents will be different from each other. They may not be tremendously different from each other, but because they are different locations on the transmission line, they will have a different complex value. The same thing with the voltage at either end of the line. And so the question is, what will be the difference between the current and voltage at either end of this very short piece of transmission line? Well, this then becomes our equivalent circuit. We know the short little piece of wire will have a resistance, which is determined simply by taking the resistance per unit length of the transmission line and multiplying it by the length of this short wire. And again, the length of this sh little short wire is delta Z. This could be a very small number. And so the resulting resistance is going to be small, but it's not going to be zero. The same thing for inductance. The inductance of this short length of wire can be determined by taking the inductance per unit length L and multiplying by the length delta Z. What about the conductance that we have? And this is for the uh, uh, dielectric, the insulator between the two wires. We simply take the value of G and multiply it by delta Z to find that conductance. And then likewise, the capacitance between these two wires, we determine by taking capacitance per unit length and multiply it by delta Z. So this can be our equivalent circuit that we have for this very short piece of transmission line. In this case, again, all the value, the uh, value of resistance and inductance and conductance and capacitance is going to be very small, but none of them will be equal to zero. And because of that, we can see that the current here at one side will be different than the current to the other because of the current through the 
uh, admittance, essentially, between the top conductor and the bottom conductor. Likewise, we'll see that the voltage from one end of the short length of transmission line and the other, these two voltages will be slightly different because of the voltage drop that occurs uh, across these this series impedance uh, associated with the wire, both resistance and inductance. So let's see if we can do that analysis. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the relationship between the voltage at one end and the voltage at the other. And to accomplish this, we'll use KVL. The difference between these two voltages is, of course, the voltage drop across this series impedance, the voltage drop across the resistance uh, in series with the inductor. And uh, using our device equations for resistor, essentially uh, uh, Ohm's law here, or specifically Ohm's law here, uh, the voltage drop across the resistor, and likewise for our device equation uh, for inductance, J may L uh, uh, times I will be the voltage across that uh, little bit of, of uh, self-inductance that we have of that wire. Um, and so this becomes our first equation that analyzes this little short piece of our transmission line. All right, now what about the uh, difference in current from one end of our transmission line section to the other. The difference in this current by KCL is simply the current then through this, uh, the shunt uh, elements here, uh, the um, uh, which can be determined from the voltage across them times their admittance. And so the current through the uh, dielectric that we have can be determined from its conductance uh, using this equation, knowing the voltage across here, we can determine the current through it. Likewise, the displacement current then through this capacitance uh, can be determined from the voltage and the value J omega C, uh, or in this case C delta Z is the capacitance value that we have for that small section. And that is, uh, that is uh, given right here. <coughs> All right, so just for fun, let's say we take those two equations, one from KCL and one from KVL, and we uh, divide each side by the small distance of our transmission line delta Z, and we get this result here. We collect terms, and one interesting thing here is if we look on the right side of the first equation, uh, we have I times the value of R plus J omega L. R plus J omega L, of course, is impedance, uh, but this is impedance then per unit length. It depends on the frequency of the oscillation that we have, of course. But uh, we had resistance per unit length, we have inductance per unit length, but if we have uh, J omega L, that would be reactance per unit length in addition to the resistance. This is impedance per unit length. Likewise, for the second equation on the right side, <clears throat> we have the admittance per unit length. G is conductance per unit length, C is capacitance per unit length, but J omega C is susceptance per unit length, and we add susceptance to conductance, and we have admittance per unit length. So I times the impedance per unit length gives us this result. V times the admittance per unit length gives us this result. And these results tell us essentially the change in the voltage along our transmission line normalized to the length, or the change in the current from one end to the other of that short second normalized by, um, by the uh, length of that small section. Now, the lumped element circuit that we use to determine uh, all these results are an approximation of the uh, transmission line, or length of transmission line, I should say. But what we find is that approximation is increasingly accurate as the value of delta Z gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it approaches zero. So we could go through and say, all right, to really get a good accurate representation of these equations, I should take the limit as delta Z goes to zero. So let's do that and see what happens. So we take the limit of those two equations, and uh, the interesting uh, thing that pops out at us, jumps out at us, when you look at the left side of these two equations, the limit as delta Z goes to zero of voltage Z plus delta Z 
minus voltage at Z divided by delta Z. Same thing for current. Now, this gives us a sense of deja vu, doesn't it? We think we've seen something like this before. We take a function at one point and subtract it from the same function at a point just slightly different and then divide by the difference of those two points and take the limit as that difference goes to zero. And of course, you recall this from your um, first calculus course. So from calculus, you recall that this is uh, the definition of the derivative operator. And so we see this is exa exactly the form that we have in our previous two equations. And so we can replace the uh, two expressions, the left side, uh, with simply the first derivative of the voltage and current with respect to position z. And of course, this is the derivative of a complex function, but that doesn't uh, change uh, uh, the result in any way. Basically, we're saying it's the uh, derivative of a complex function is the derivative of the real part plus the derivative of the imaginary part. So uh, um, uh, it's not a challenge to go through and do this mathematics. So we can replace everything on the left side of our two equations with a simple first derivative. And so let's rewrite the analysis we had, we had analysis we had for our short piece of transmission line. So we um, go through and do that. We replace the left side of the two equations with the first derivative. And what we find are these results, these two equations, and these are sort of the Maxwell's equations of transmission lines, uh, the governing equations of transmission lines, a uh, set of differential equations, coupled differential equations. We call these the telegrapher equations. Sometimes they're called the heavy side equations and probably justifiably should be called heavy side uh, equations. Um, Oliver Heaviside, the person who uh, developed these, determined these, um, is an interesting character, lived in the 19th century. Uh, Oliver Heaviside, it could be argued, was the first uh, true electrical engineer. Um, uh, Heaviside uh, was not a mathematician. Heaviside was not a physicist, the way that uh, uh, Hertz was or Maxwell was. Instead, uh, Heaviside was just someone who worked as a telegraph operator and was frustrated because the telegraph uh, had limitations in terms of how far uh, one could uh, transmit before the uh, dots and dashes sort of turned into an uh, indecipherable mess. And so he became curious as to why this was happening and tried to figure out what was going on on these wires that they used for the transmission lines. And he stumbled across um, Maxwell's treaties, which had just been uh, published, his treaties on electromagnetism. And he realized that this is probably the thing he needed to understand if he wanted to figure out what was going on on the telegraph wires that he was, uh, what he was using. Uh, the problem was uh, Oliver Heaviside had hardly any education at all. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, understanding Maxwell and his treaties was very difficult, even for the most educated of mathematics, mathematicians and physicists. But he uh, set out to try to figure it out and try to figure out how to apply it to um, uh, to these transmission lines, these uh, telegraph wires that, that he was using. And he became obsessed with this. He basically quit his job. He lived with his sister and uh, her husband and uh, uh, basically mooched off them and and uh, had them uh, take care of him for the rest of his life. He sat in his room all day and just worked on Maxwell and trying to decipher it and then apply it to um, these transmission lines. Um, and um, he was certainly a brilliant person because he was able to do just that. And he came up then with this set of equations that described uh, the behavior of transmission lines. And again, these are the fundamental equations of transmission line theories, the telegrapher equations. Again, probably should be called the heavy side equations. I say these are the Maxwell's equations of transmission lines. They actually can be traced back to Maxwell's equations. Um, <clears throat> Effectively, uh, this is Faraday's law, and the second equation can be traced back to Ampere's law. So these uh, can be directly connected to uh, Maxwell's uh, equations there.
Um, and what we're going to do is try to solve these differential equations. That's what they are, differential equations. They're coupled because here we have the derivative of the total voltage or the uh, complex voltage in one equation, and we have the complex voltage likewise in the second. We have the complex current in one equation, the first equation, but we have its first derivative here in the second. So we want to go through and find solutions to these. Only functions of position for current and voltage which satisfy these two equations can physically exist along a transmission line. So let's see if we can figure out what those solutions are.